How great is our God. Good morning, everybody. It's that wonderful Thursday morning. Uh, everybody is coming on board. We have Ruth. Good morning, Miss Ruth. Good morning, Miss Carolyn. There's sweet Sherry. There's Miss Donna. There's Miss Cynthia. Good morning. So happy to be with all of you this morning. I pray you're feeling better and uh, getting stronger day by day. Uh, had a good day yesterday. Two great Bible studies. Had fun. Had uh, and just, uh, just blessings, just blessing after blessing. And there's Buddy and Julia. How'd everything go yesterday, Buddy? We had a chance to pray for you. I pray that uh, it wasn't too hard on you and that you're back up and chipper this morning. And Georgia has come on board, folks. All right. Well, we are still in John 5. We will be today and tomorrow. I don't know that I can get it completely wrapped up. Uh, uh, tomorrow, so we may overlap into Monday, but uh, these two chapters are vitally important because what we'll be going into, uh, starting in chapter 6, is the darkest period of human history, and it is dark as we're going to be looking. Uh, good morning, Lonnie. Good morning, Nancy. It's good to have Virginia on board with us. Well, just in, uh, just in back pain. All right, buddy. Uh, we'll be praying for that. Good morning, Miss Helen. And there's Miss Terry as well. So yay. Y'all keep popping it. Just fill the screen up. The more the merrier. Uh, but what we're going to enter into starting in chapter six, when the first seal is broken and the releasing of the, uh, the first white horse, uh, the first uh, of the four horsemen, if you will, uh, we'll be feeling better today. Thank you all for your prayers. You bet, buddy. Absolutely. But it is the darkest history in the in, in in human history. We're going to be bouncing between heaven and and earth. Everything that happens, you know, all the action up here happens in in heaven, and then you know we see it played out on the scene on earth as people go through the judgments that God pours out upon the earth. We'll talk more about that. We're going to get into six next week. We will lay out you know kind of the the format for for this period of time. Uh, and what all of this means and what it means to those in future generations and what it means to us right here and right now. But for now, 
we're enjoying and that's what we need to do we need to revel in soak in as much of the atmosphere of heaven as we can before we go into this uh, this dark period of time you see john is being drawn further and further into the activities of heaven here in chapter 5 and he sees the ancient of days sitting upon the uh, the throne of judgment and in his right hand is the seven sealed scroll and then he sees this powerful angel step forward and uh, proclaim in verses 2 and 3 who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals verse 3 says but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it so no one stepped forward who was worthy no one in heaven earth or under the earth john begins to weep and uh weep because there was no one found worthy to look inside but there was a solution and the solution came in the form of a sovereign savior then one of the elders said to me john writes stop weeping look the lion of the tribe of judah the root of david has conquered and thus he can open the scroll and its seven seals so he's identified to John as the Lion of Judah and the Root of, of, of David. Good morning, Miss Gail. Good to have you and Fred aboard as well. Uh, the result of Christ's redemptive victory, uh, part of it at least, is the capacity, the authority, the right the, to rule, to break the seals and pour out the judgments. He and he alone can open the scroll. And that refers to Christ's authority, his right to reveal the prophecies of the book, first to John and then to the church. He is the only qualified person. He is, as we'll look deeper into today, the kinsman redeemer. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for assembling together those for the study this morning. I pray that you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear exactly what it is that the Spirit of God is saying to us. Open the heart of our understanding that we might see the spectacular wonder and glory of God. Let us get a glimpse of what it is through John's eyes that he saw. And Lord, let us rejoice in knowing you. We come realizing that the things of this book are beyond our understanding unless the Holy Spirit open up our understanding and let us see into the heart of God and to understand with the mind of Christ. So we come, leaving ourselves open to you, asking you to be our tutor, our teacher. Let us mark down those things that you say to us individually, Lord, that we might apply them to our life. Give us the wisdom we need to apply your word to our daily living, that, Father, the world may have a clear testament written in the hearts of your people, to the mercy and the grace of our God. I believe, Lord, more than being a book of judgment, Revelation is a book that shows us grace and mercy upon grace and mercy. So, Lord, give us wisdom this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's uh, go ahead and continue to move in and see what else it is that, uh, that John sees. Uh, he says uh, in verse 6, he says, Then I saw standing in the middle of the throne of, of, and the four living creatures and the middle of the elders a lamb, a lamb that appeared to have been slain. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out from all the earth. So now we have the Trinity coming together. We have the Ancient of Days upon the throne. We have the, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah stepping forward to take the scroll. And the, 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 the image of him uh, tells you that the, the Spirit is on board because he has, he has seven horns and the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, each part of this symbolism describes a certain aspect of Christ's person and work and of, of the Godhead. But speaking particularly of, of, of Christ, we have a lamb. Uh, since the one standing is the lamb of God, we might have expected that to be, instead of a lamb, the lamb, having that definite article in there uh, along with the noun. But it's absent, which you know is, is strange because it's not absent in other places. 
But the absence of the article draws our attention to the quality and the character of Christ as God's sacrificial lamb. Now, I mentioned to you yesterday, because this is where we stop, uh, the term there is arnion. That's the term that is used for lamb. The regular word for lamb is arnon, but arnion is a diminutive form of the word, and it means little lamb, kind of like Mary's little lamb. Uh, you know, but it came to be used as a term of endearment. Not, not in, in any way derision. The sacrificial lambs were not just lambs taken out of the flock, but those which had been uh, uh, brought into the home uh, before the mass production of, of, of the lambing and everything in the temple. They would bring the lamb into the home and care for it like a pet. Uh, the kids, you know, you, you could just see the kids loving it and petting it and it became a member of the family. But then they would take that lamb at the proper time and they would uh, would clean it up and, and, and everything, no blemish or anything. They'd take it to the priest where the priest would, would slaughter the lamb and drain its blood. And then they would skin it and hang its, its carcass upon, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, you know uh, an implement to, to, to bleed out, to dry out. They'd take the blood and they would, would pour the blood out and then the lamb would be given back to the family where they'd take it home and roast it for the uh, Passover dinner. So uh, it, it was, can you imagine, uh, you know, taking the family pet, as it were, uh, that you had, and you have had it and groomed it for that purpose from the very beginning of having it and then taking it, how it would break your heart, how it would tear your, your heart. It gives you an idea, and this is the purpose behind it, to give them an idea of what it costs God to make atonement for the sins of man by giving his only begotten son. It expresses God's love for his son and what it cost him to give him for us. And, and that point is driven home over and over you know, throughout Scripture that it wasn't a, a, a spontaneous thing. It was thought out. God planned it. Uh, he sent his son. His son lived uh, unblemished by the world. But then, no wonder God turned the lights out while Jesus was on the cross. Uh, to behold that lamb bearing the sins of the world, when God was too holy to bear that. The term lion is used of Christ only once here in Revelation. Uh, it, it, it's only going to be found here in this book. Though the book reveals Christ and his lion-like majesty, his authority and character, but the term arneon, or little lamb, occurs in Revelation 28 different times. The point is simply that his kingly crown, his rule, and his power lies in the person of Jesus Christ, the redemptive work of the Lamb of God who died in our place. You see, all of this in 4 and 5 are prelude to what's going to start in chapter 6. And we have to see the justification uh, that, that is here, that God is just in what he's about to do. Uh, because of all that God did for us, the rebellion of man, you know, it, God is just in judging the sins of man and pouring out his wrath. Uh, the biggest battle was won on the cross. Uh, when the lamb died in our place, he could not take his place as ruler until he had become our kinsman redeemer by the sacrifices of himself as God's arneon, God's little lamb. Remember, I press the fact that to understand what goes on in this final book, we have to have a decent working knowledge of the previous 65 books, especially those 39 books of the Old Testament, in particular those passages that point to the second advent of the Messiah. To understand the depth of the impact of what we're talking and what we're looking at, we need to take one more trip down a circle drive. We, Sherry and I used to live on a street called Circle Drive. Uh, and uh, we were living on that street when our girls were born in Westminster, Colorado. 
and you get on that street and you could drive on that street. You could stay on Circle Drive and it would keep going around until ultimately you came right back around to where you started. That's the very definition of a Circle Drive, is it not? Okay, well, we're going to we're gonna get on a circle drive now. We're going to drive down a circle drive called the Kinsman Redeemer, which will bring us right back around to where we are. The Kinsman Redeemer, or in Hebrew, the Goel. If you've ever heard uh, the, the term Goel, that is the word for Kinsman Redeemer. Okay, it was a male relative who, according to various laws within the Pentateuch, uh, had the privilege, those first five books, Moses' letters, the privilege and the responsibility or to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble or in danger or in need. Now, Abraham played the role before there was the law of the kinsman redeemer. As a kinsman redeemer, when he took his troops out and he, and, uh, he fought the ten kings and liberated the uh, uh, Lot brought him back and all the stuff that was stolen from him. A kinsman redeemer was designated as one who delivers or rescues. You can see it in, Ex in Genesis 48, Exodus 6, Leviticus 27 uh, and, and 25. All, uh, they redeemed persons and properties. They were uh, the ones that were designated to do it. He is the kinsman who redeems or vindicates a relative as illustrated really beautifully in the book of Ruth, where the kinsman redeemer is Boaz. Now, I'm sure that all of you and, and know, and maybe some of you don't out there that haven't signed in yet, uh, the story of Ruth and Boaz. The story of Ruth and Boaz begins when Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, returned to Bethlehem from Moab, where they'd been living. Naomi's husband and her two sons, one of them had been married to Ruth, uh, you know, were, all, were, were both dead. And one of the husbands, as I said, was Ruth, he, he had died. And so the women are left in Moab penniless and without a male protector. So Naomi is going to come back now to her ancestral home to the land that her family owns, but she's poor, she's destitute, nobody to work the land. So arriving in Bethlehem, Naomi sends Ruth out to glean the fields of Boaz. Boaz was a relative, a wealthy relative of Naomi, uh, to whom they, through a series of divinely appointed circumstances, had uh, appealed to as their Goel. And you read the whole story, but Boaz acquiesces, if you will, willingly to take Ruth as his wife, and together they would bear a son. But the story is even more intricate than that. Uh, in the story of Ruth and, and Boaz, uh, Boaz wasn't the nearest relative. There was one closer relative. So before he can take her as his wife and become the kinsman redeemer, she has to be released from the one who is next in line. So he sets at the gate, he pulls the elders together. When the man comes, he tells him, he, you know, he, he talks to him very plainly and says, here's what we have. You know, I'm willing to marry Ruth and, and redeem her land, uh, but you're the first in line. You have the right. If you want to pick up the right of the kinsman redeemer, then it is your right to do so. And he said, no, he was either unwilling or uh, unprepared, you know, to do that. Uh, maybe he didn't have the resources needed. So you, with, with the witnesses around, Boaz then steps forward to be the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. Uh, and he takes Ruth, they marry, they produce a son. That son's uh, uh, name is Obed, who became the grand, who, who was the grandfather. Well, uh, Obed, when he grew up, got married, they had a son named Jesse. And Jesse had uh, several sons. Uh, the youngest of was one named David, who is going to be the king of Israel, forerunner to Jesus. 
Now, each person who performed the office of Goel, or kinsman redeemer, became a type or a shadow of the coming eternal Goel, our kinsman redeemer. Now, in the New Testament, Christ is often referred to as an example of the kinsman redeemer because he's referred to as a brother, for example, uh, 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 the nearest of relatives. In Hebrews chapter 2, you can mark this down in your journal. You can look it up. You might remember it from our study of Hebrews, and you might not. For indeed, he who makes holy and those being made holy are all of the same origin. And so he is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Why? Because we are born then of God. And since we are born of God, we are of the same origin, right? John 1. For as many as received him, he gave the right, the authority to become the children of God, even those who believe on his name, who are not born of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God or the will of God. So when we are born of God, coming into the family of God, we are heirs and joint heirs together with Christ. And we can call, you know, he calls us brother and sister saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. Also, he redeems us because of our great need, like Ruth who had a great need or Lot who had a great need. Redemption came at the point of our great need, one that only he can satisfy because only he is the uniquely qualified person. In Ruth 3 and verse 9, we see this picture beautifully portrayed of a needy supplicant unable to rescue herself, requesting of a kinsman redeemer, the Goel, that he cover her with his protection, redeem her, and make her his wife. Now, we know that that when you know the story that uh, she sends, uh, 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 Naomi sends Ruth to the threshing floor where they've been threshing all night, and she waits until the men lays down. And then according to the, the, uh, the story, she goes and finds where Boaz is sleeping. And she uncovers his legs from the, uh, with a, uh, uh, that's under a blanket. She crawls in next to him and covers him over. That's such a beautiful picture of, of uh, uh, the, the need and the request for protection, uh, for redemption from the kinsman redeemer. Now, as I said, Boaz is not the nearest relative, but Ruth chapter four shows that the nearest relative was neither either unwilling or unable to meet his obligation. So the kinsman redeemer passes the right on to Boaz, who then willingly, and this is a key issue, the kinsman redeemer had to be willing. It couldn't be coerced or forced upon him to act as a kinsman redeemer. It was something that had to be done willingly. So he willingly fulfills that duty, marries in Ruth, thus preserving the birthright of his kin, Malon, the son of um, uh, uh, Eliminet, who is the deceased husband of, of Ruth. That would be Mahon. From that union, as I said, you have Boab. From Boab's union, you have Jesse. From Jesse's union, you have David. All this, you know, is, is said so that in the same way we would see this picture play out. The Lord Jesus Christ willingly brought us to himself, willingly bought us for himself, bought us out of the curse, out of our destitution, made us his own beloved bride, blessed us for all generations. He is the true kinsman redeemer, the true Goel, the eternal Goel of all who call on him in faith. You see, that makes him worthy than to be the one that sets in judgment. Our redemption is what we see being played out. As a human race, the Bible refers to us as, as carnal, and as Romans 7 and verse 14 says, 
For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, listen to this, sold into slavery to sin. Every one of us, when we are born into this world, are born into the bondage of sin. We are slaves to sin. We are under sin. And since the wages of sin is eternal death, we all need or needed a redeemer. That's why in our spiritually poor and pitiful state, God decided to show us uh, the, uh, in, in, in the coming ages, he says, uh, the surpassing wealth of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to be our kinsman redeemer. It, it all had to fit the pattern that God had set from the very beginning. So what qualifications did Jesus have that qualified him to be our kinsman redeemer? So think about it. Let me give you some. Uh, you can write them down. I think I may have put them up there. Yes. A kinsman redeemer had to be a close relative. I mentioned that. Jesus, the Son of God, became human like us with a body made of flesh and blood. The Bible says he was not ashamed to call us brethren. Jesus showed that he be, brings us so close to himself that, uh, and, and to God that we can be called his children. Now, under that, go ahead and put the verse I shared with you earlier out of, first, out of John 1, 12 and 13. But to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he has given the right. Now, you can put in parentheses there, right means the authority. We have the authority, given authority to become the children of God or God's children. Children not born by human parents or by human desire or a husband's decision, but by God. As such, God has made us heirs and co-heirs with him just as kinsmen were co-heirs to the land of Israel. Number two, the Redeemer had to be willing. In the case of Ruth and Boaz, the nearest kinsman was not willing to redeem Naomi's land and marry Ruth. But when God sent his son to redeem us, Jesus' response was a willing response. He chose to come. Mark this down under number two. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. So when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Whole burnt offerings, sin offerings you took no delight in. Then I said, Here I am. I have come. It is written of me in the scroll of the book to do your will, O God. What did he say to his disciples in John 4? Mark that down. He says, My, my meat, you know, uh, my will is to do the will of him who sent me. What did he say to his parents when he was 12 years old? I need to be about my father's business. What did he pray in the garden? Not my will, but yours. You see, Jesus was willing to lay his life down to be our kinsman redeemer. Jesus said, I delight to do your will, oh my God. He was willing to, to, to come and to redeem us. Now third, write this down in your journals. A kinsman redeemer had to be rich enough to pay the redemption price. Maybe that's the reason that the closest relative to Naomi didn't want to take up the, the role of kinsman redeemer because he didn't have the resources, whereas Boaz did. The good news is that God is rich in glory by Christ Jesus. God, with all of his riches divested in Christ, he had everything that was needed to pay the debt in full. Through Christ, we have been redeemed. Mark this down, Isaiah 43, 1. Put that under number three. He says, but now thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Actually, the very name of Jesus means uh, Savior, doesn't it? 
He was born to save us. Save us from the slavery of sin and the bondage of Satan. He is our Goel, our kinsman redeemer. Christ paid the price, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. Write that one down. And if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, live out the time of your temporary residence here in reverence. You know that from your empty way of life inherited from your ancestors, you were ransomed, not by perishable things like silver and gold, but the, but the precious blood, that of the unblemished and spotless lamb, namely Christ. What price was paid for our redemption? Since the wages of sin is death, Jesus died for us to pay our debt. He tasted death for every man and gave himself a ransom from all, Scripture says. And not only us, but for the entire planet, for all of men. The Bible tells us creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the sons of God, Romans 8. And that at a time is coming when everything will be made new. We are approaching that time. But before all things have been made new, the old has to be purged. Fourth, write this down in your journals. A kinsman redeemer was to continue the name of his relatives. If a person was married and died without an heir to carry on his name, it was the duty of the Goel to marry the widow so that she could bear an offspring that would carry on the relative's name. Now, through Christ, we are born again and given an opportunity to live with him eternally. And since Jesus paid the redemption price, he is our only hope for redemption. The Bible makes this plain when it says in Acts 4.12, there is no salvation in, in, in no one else, or there is salvation in no one else, for there is no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus alone paid our redemptive price. He wants you to know that you were bought with a price <coughs> and that we are his. And he welcomes us to enjoy the privileges of being his brethren and co-heirs with him in his kingdom. Also, he calls you to commit to him since we are his by redemption. This is all being played out on the stage in front of John. In big, bold colors with neon lights. John recognizes it that we must also so what can we learn from this? How, how, how is your courage today? Do you feel like you need a kinsman redeemer? I know there are many out here that are listening, that are elating me and asking some of the very right questions. So I'd ask you, if you're out there listening today, do you need a kinsman redeemer because of your current circumstance? Do you need the one who authoritatively can redeem you? Do you feel like you need a Boaz to come your way? Do you feel that it's time for the Jubilee year, that your sins can be wiped away? And as believers, if, if, if you and I have been redeemed. Our, can, do we live in the assurance and the, and the fullness and the joy and the power that comes because we have been redeemed? because he lives within us. Good news is that Jesus is our Goel. He exists for our salvation and freedom, and he longs to set the captives free. That's why it's so tragic when you see believers still living in bondage to the past or to a mistake or to an attitude. For there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. Do you rejoice in that freedom? 
Now, see, we've come all the way around just simply to come full circle and back to here. There is coming a day, and I believe a day very soon, when Jesus comes back. He will restore what is lacking. He will redeem what was sold. He will judge what is unrighteous. He will set right what is broken. He will bring you to heaven. He will restore you and give you complete freedom. He will permanently overthrow the prince of the power of the air. That time is coming. And it begins right here at John's glimpse into heaven as the tribulation judgment is about to begin to unfold. Coming full circle, we come back to verse 4 and 5. I began weeping bitterly because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is conquered. Thus he can open the scrolls and its seven seals. The figure of the lamb perfectly expresses the submission and control, the gentleness, the meekness of Christ as silent before his shears as he is led to the cross to bear our sins. And this is clearly prominent in the emphasis of this chapter and is declared to be one of the reasons of his worthiness to open the book and break the seals. Now I want you to look. Verses 9 and 10. They were singing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were killed. And at the cost of your own blood, you have purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Verse 10, you have appointed them as, king, as a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth the earth. Now I want you to, to maybe underline some of that. You're worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were killed and at the cost of your own blood you have purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And then go back to verse 6. He said, Then I saw standing in the middle of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the middle of the elders, a lamb that appeared to have been killed. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Now, what are what what praise is going on over there? You know, you you were slain, and you purchased this with your own blood. Now, what is it that John says he's singing? This is key a lamb that appeared to have been killed, the New International, or the New English Translation. The NIV says, looking as if it had been slain. The New American Standard says, uh, standing as if slain, but better. The NLT, the lamb that appeared to have been slaughtered. He's standing. This is perfect tense of the verb shistmi, it means to stand. He had been slain, but now he's seen not dead, but very much alive, indeed standing, firmly positioned, immovable, and ready to judge. The perfect tense stresses the firm position that he holds, as if slain, or literally as slaughtered. Brings us back to that picture of the family bringing the, the the family lamb, you know, to be not just killed but slaughtered for the Passover. This verb means to slay, to slaughter. It was used especially for animals that was destined for a sacrifice. The obvious reference now is that of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Again, the Greek text employs the perfect tense which stresses a completed action with results going on into the presence. He wasn't just slaughtered at a point in time. He was slaughtered for all time and eternity. And the effects of his death still has its effect in the same manner today and will tomorrow and the next day. The continuing results were not... Uh, 
a continued death, but the effective results of Christ's substitution. That work for our sin and his death and, and, and with it the defeat of Satan's power. The position of standing points him as the resurrected and victorious Savior. And the marks are there, the marks of death on his resurrected body. We know that for when he when he presented himself to his disciples. And he even said to, to Thomas, here, here's the holes of my hand, touch them. Here's the gash of my side, touch it. The marks are nevertheless there in his resurrection body, undoubtedly everlasting symbols of his sacrifice to us. He, he's seen as one who had been slain. The marks of his death are there. He had seven horns. The horns are a symbol of power and of government, and the seven is the number of perfection. It shows us that Christ's power and government is perfect. And he will be victorious over all of his enemies and rule in perfect righteousness and justice, just as prophesied in Isaiah 11. He has seven eyes, and the eyes are symbolic of, of Christ's omniscience, his wisdom, his insight. Again, seven represents the totality or perfection of his knowledge and insight. In Colossians 2, 2 and 3, it says, My goal is that their heart, having been knit together in love, may be encouraged that they may have the, all the riches that the assurance brings in their understanding of the knowledge and the mystery of God, namely Christ. Look at verse 3. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The next he says is that there were, uh, which are the seven spirits of God. Though Christ himself is omniscient, he is also the one who sends forth the Holy Spirit into all the earth, who likewise knows and sees all things. Nothing is hidden from God. None of his actions and his decisions and his righteous judgments against sin of mankind will be made with partial knowledge. People go into court today and they can be found guilty on circumstantial evidence. There will be no circumstantial evidence in the court of law, in God's chamber of law, if you will. No decision, no judgment will be poured out in chapter 6 through 19 that on partial knowledge, but with complete understanding. That's what we need to see. Verse 7, then he took the scroll, and then he came and he took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. What an incredible scene that is. And oh, we're going to have to stop right there because I am got wrapped up and we're running out of time. But we'll pick this up tomorrow right here at this scene. This is a good place to pick it up tomorrow. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of the, of the throne sitter, the one seating on the throne, the ancient of days. And we're drawn right back, are we not, to, to, to Daniel. When the throne is set and the Ancient of Days sets on it and the one like the Son of Man comes, we're at that point in Daniel's prophecy. We'll pick up on this tomorrow morning. But have you got enough there to work through today, to meditate on, to think on, to, to mull over until you, you understand it and, it, and, and and you can make those applications to your heart line up and you're out there today and you're still in your, your sin, you're, you're still struggling, you're still looking for the answer for the blessed hope, it's there. He is your kinsman redeemer. He will redeem you from your sin-stricken life. He will put his life in you and you will be his child. You will be his brother. You will be in the family of God. All you have to do is just invite him in. Acknowledge that you have sinned and rebelled against him. Seek his forgiveness. He will forgive you. He will. God lives them breathes to forgive and show mercy. We have come to him today. For those of us that know him, will we live for him today? This is the time that we have. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Pray, Lord, that you impress it more deeply than ever upon our heart. Let us understand the closeness of your coming 
and let us be prepared. And part of that preparation, Lord, is to be about the work you've given us to do, to proclaim your name to the nations. And it may be the nation across the street or next door or in the next room. But Father, may we be found faithful when you come. Lord, I just ask that you bless with all the blessings that you have promised to these who are hearing and reading this, your testament. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. May the blessings of God be multiplied in you today. And may you be used of him in great and wonderful ways. Pray for one another. Remember all of those. It's good to have people back from vacation and plug back in. It's good to see Buddy came through yesterday. Okay. Uh, those of you that are, are, you know, are, are out there, I just want you to know that I love you. And I'll see you tomorrow morning at 9. And we will pick right up here and move deeper into this scene in Chapter 5. God bless you.